message so we'll we'll call on you to read i want to talk to you about a real important thing uh, something i've taught on several times and the lord's really dealt with me on it on a personal level and several times and seasons in my life i want to talk about living free from anger anger so uh you know jesus when you read the gospels jesus has has a vision for the whole world and it includes us that he wants people to live free he wants them to be free from sin he wants them to be free from what we're going to talk about today free from anger he wants us to live clean jesus believes clean living is good he wants us to be secure in who we are and who god is he wants us to live in peace and joy and righteousness and confidence he wants us to live a fulfilled blessed life you believe that I mean, he's, he's, he actually paved the way for all that to happen, but there's just one condition, and it's a big condition. You've got to follow him to get there, to get to all that blessing and all that life that he talks about. You, you, Jesus was very plain and clear. You've got to hear what I say, hear what I teach, and, and then what? And then do it, right? And we've got to do it. So Jesus wants us to live free. We're going to talk specifically about this idea of living free from anger. I got, I got a couple things. Some of y'all got excited. And this is my birthday balloons. Y'all, y'all put that on the back. I didn't even see that. Um, y'all, uh, some people thought I may have had some food up here. I got a pressure cooker and a crock pot. And, and uh, I got you a little trusty stick of dynamite here. So it's a <laughs> window. I probably could have called you. You probably got a stick of dynamite like this, don't you? <laughs> no, no, we don't. <laughs> he ain't going to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right yeah, this you're speaking of dynamite you, you heard the joke about the uh the, the the guy who went fishing and he he just kept catching all these fish and come in the game board and saw him and he said bubba how are you catching all these fish and bubba told the game board, he said just come with me one day and i'll show you so bubba gets in the boat they get out on the lake out there and bubba reaches in his box and he pulls out a stick of dynamite and he, he lights it, he, and the game warden says, whoa, whoa, you can't do that. You can't do that, Bubba. And, and Bubba throwed the dynamite to the game warden. He said, you going to hold it or you going to fish? <laughs> <laughs> so, so is that what you're talking about? <laughs> so, that, yeah, that's right. So, uh, <laughs> so, all right, so anger. Have you noticed that, that the tender box is getting a little hotter and hotter all the time with everybody? It seems like everywhere you go, things are just a little bit more charged these days. And, of course, we're having all kinds of violence break out and things of that nature. Everybody seems to be on edge, and anger is kind of like right here in everybody's throat. I mean, even, even good folks, you know. Um, we got new terminology we developed in our generation, you know, things like you're familiar with the term road rage and air rage and work rage. And, and back, back when we were coming up, remember there was a lot of stuff happening at the post office, and they called it, remember that, what was that saying we said? Going postal. We talked about that, right? You got domestic violence and school violence, all the things going, and now courts are regularly appointing people to anger management type situations where they have to go to classes or counselors. Uh, there's just a real problem with anger, and even, even among Christians, even among Christians. So I want to start with this, this uh, premise right here, this, this uh, statement from Dallas Willard in his book called The Divine Conspiracy. A quote from him, it says that there is nothing that can be done with anger that cannot be done better without it. There is nothing that can be done with anger that cannot be done better without it. In other words, you can do without it, and you can live your life without it. You can manage your household without it. You can manage your business. You know, the world really does think. Now, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of places, a lot of people think that unless you're mean and nasty, you can't manage your company or your business or whatever. And I understand some folks try you, but anger's, anger's not, not to be a part of our lives, really. Not, not in this kind of way. All right, so let, let's talk about some, some of this. So Jesus dives right into a, a key problem with the human heart with anger right here. And, and we're, we're just kind of at the about 20 verses in, 21 verses in to the Sermon on the Mount as we're going to get there. Jesus is coming to heal our hearts. He said that I, I've come to heal the brokenhearted, right? And we think brokenhearted, we think all people that are sad. But you know what? Our, our hearts are broken. It's simply meaning like if, you're, if your car is broken or if a, if, a, if a dish is broken, it just means it's, it's not functioning right. It's not, it's not able to be used properly. And Jesus comes and says, I come to heal the brokenness in your heart. And this, this anger, the way we use anger and the way we treat each other, uh, this is a major way that we don't function right as human beings, is this idea of anger. So let's hear what Jesus has to say in Matthew 5, 
21 through 24. Again, if we were in a red letter edition Bible, you would see that this is right there written in red. This is the words of Jesus. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. That makes sense, right? Don't kill folks. That's kind of that's kind of society 101, right? Verse 22. But I say to you, Jesus is going up the bar right here. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So Jesus says right here, just right off. He says, it's, it's just not good enough. Say, I, I didn't kill anybody. Jesus says, I don't even want that anger roosting in your heart. You can't even want to kill them. You can't even want to. Yeah. Because imagine what people would do if they thought they could get away with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they are sometimes getting away with it nowadays. Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Now, Raka is kind of, was, a, was kind of a slur or something, that, a slang word that somebody would use to call somebody. Literally translated, it, it kind of means empty-headed one, something like that. It would be something that you would just really, it's something very pejorative to, to really slam somebody is, is the idea. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So he just, just upped it up. Verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, all this that may be provoking anger, this conflict between you and somebody else, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. And first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Or Jesus would say, then come and worship. You see, boy, that's pretty high level that Jesus put our relationship with each other on, this, on that level as our relationship with God. And Jesus said, basically, I'm, I'm just going to tell you how Father is about this stuff. Father don't want to hear all of your stuff, all your worship, all your singing. He don't want to receive your off offering if you knowingly have something between you and somebody else and you hadn't tried to work it out. That, that, that's pretty tough, isn't it? All right. So now, anger. We all, we all know what it is, kind of, right? It's that, that feeling that we get displeasure, whatever, stirred up by something that's done wrong. Okay, now there's this, this thing as righteous indignation. We've heard that before. But what we're dealing with is, is, the, is, the, is the other side of the coin. It's the not-so-good side of it. This, this Anger in itself is a God-given emotion to help us survive if we get into a, a tight situation or something like that. Or maybe even to motivate us into doing the right thing sometimes. But the way we use anger is totally different. You notice he, he, he says, don't, he said, the, the law says, I mean, it's in the Ten Commandments, don't, don't murder anybody. That, that's the bar right here. And Jesus says, I don't want you to even be angry with people. Now, that, that's pretty tough, isn't it? That's a pretty tough order. So what, what, here, here's the progression. So you're angry. Something has happened. Something has happened. A situation has occurred. A conflict has occurred between you and somebody else. And, and that anger begins to stir. And sometimes it happens all real quickly. Sometimes it, it stews for a little while. But something's churning inside of you, and it ain't good. And you're just getting, oh, boy, said so you're getting madder and madder, you know. And then that, that anger then turns to contempt. You know what contempt is? Like if you're in contempt of court, what does that mean? It, that means you're, you're, like a, in a, you're disrupting either the, the function process or, or you're unwilling to participate. It's, it's, the contempt right here is the idea of being mean or disrespectful in some kind of way. And you begin to be so angry at this individual or maybe a group or whatever it might be and you just begin to get contempt in your heart and you just become real mean towards them. And you may not have the courage to do it to their face, but oftentimes contempt is done behind people's backs and, you know, the old backstabbing thing, that kind of deal. And then that contempt turns to malice. And malice is, I mean, malice is like a criminal charge, you know. Intent with malice is what people say. So what's malice? Malice is the desire to harm somebody. So this anger begins to seethe and it begins to grow and it goes from contempt and now it goes to, for desire to make somebody else suffer. That's malice. And if you take malice far enough, you get to murder. That's where Jesus was talking. 
So the deal is, is let's, let's keep the train off the tracks. Let's don't try to stop a moving train and stop trying to kill somebody. Jesus says, I, I, I want you to just not even go there. I want you to be the kind of people on the planet who are just not stirred up with that kind of anger towards people. Hmm. And murder, you know, I would like to think nobody in here physically or anybody listening to me would physically murder somebody or literally mur murder somebody. But we would with this. You don't believe it, read Facebook. Read all kinds of nonsense on Instagram and people jamming on people and doing all kinds of stupid stuff as if they were the moral authority of the universe or something. And they will literally have your head on a stick if they can. See, that, that's, that's another form, form of murder you, you want to destroy. We've all witnessed it. Probably all have participated. You don't have to, it's not confession. The confession booth is not open right now. <laughs> but we, we, you, know, you know how it works. You, you've been living a long time. We've all had to deal with all of this at some level or another. Somebody's offended us. Something severe has happened. Hmm. The problem with anger is, is that we use it to manipulate people to get our way or to hear our voice or whatever it might be. We, we, we try to use anger to control people. You know, have any of you ever worked for an angry boss? Mm-hmm. It's rough, isn't it? And, and they literally think they cannot do their job or you will not do your job unless they are absolutely fired off 100% mad at you all the time. I mean, I, I, anybody ever have a coach like that? Oh, Lord, they all oh, mine were like that. I mean, they just... I even had a dad like that. <laughs> you, yeah, your dad was like, I understand. Uh, my, my grandfather was like that, you know? Just could not even manage anything. It, it, was, it was zero to 60 in 1.3 seconds. You know what I'm saying? Just right to the top, right then. You know? Um, so we use it to try to control people, try to get people to do what we want them to do. And I, I'm just telling you, Jesus says there's a better way to manage your life, to manage your responsibilities, to manage your classrooms, to manage your ball teams, to manage your, your, your business. All, there's a better way to do it. You don't have to be the proverbial bulldozer that plows through everything just so you can get things done. Because in Jesus' mind, if you get something done and you ruin everybody's life in the process, what you did doesn't even matter. You know what I'm talking about? Even if we think it's the right thing. And we all know anger can be very destructive and we all have scars from it. You know, I've got scars from my own anger, not, not to throw off on anybody else. I've, I've been, I've been the, the brunt of other people's anger as well. But I think about my own life, how anger has scarred my life. And I've got several things that, that we could go into testimony time. If you ask me later, I'll, I'll tell you maybe. <laughs> Some of it's very embarrassing, shameful, you know. Um, but like I, I've got a, I got a broke hand right here. Just a knot right back there, bones laying on top of it like that. Come in the fight, it's stupid. Cost me a scholarship to Ole Miss. A week before my high school playoff. Got, I was at a party, doing something I shouldn't have been doing, hanging out with a bunch of people I shouldn't have been hanging out with, and a guy that we just didn't like each other from day one. See, I, I was the kind of the, 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 the jock kind of group guy, and he was the hoodlum kind of guy, you know? You know, you know the guy? He looked apart. I promise you, if I showed you a picture, you'd be like, yeah, I know where he, he, just, he just looked apart. He just was that. We, we clashed all the time. We, we fought in the hot, hot hallway several times. I mean, just, uh, I lived in a day way back when, when you could fight, they'd paddle you and sit your butt back in class. You know, the good old days. <laughs> but we, we, you know, we got into it at a party, ended up breaking my hand. Coach called me. About a week after that, he said, I heard what happened. He said, I'm just letting you know the scholarship's off the table now. I don't want anybody on my team that can't control themselves. And right there. Oh, that was a, that was a fast track to the major leagues right there. And it, it was gone. Just because I couldn't keep my cool. And my life has been scarred a few times like that. But just, I, you know, I ain't always been past the run. <laughs> you know, yeah. I know it's hard for y'all to believe that. And, and I'm so nice and everything and so kind and sweet and all that <laughs> I got a little bit of vinegar in me but you know but I ain't always been that way 
And I've, I've, been, I've had all kinds of brushes with this problem right here. And uh, I know what Jesus is talking about. Because, you know, <laughs> we used to do a lot of prison ministry when we were in Georgia. And uh, you'd meet those guys and you'd talk to them about the story. And they'd tell you their testimony and things like that and things they did. And it, it always happened with me. When I heard their story, I thought about my life. And I, I, I mean, I, I wasn't doing it when I was with them. But when I got back home, I was like, dear Lord, I, I was like one half a second from being right there. You know, just, mm. all right, so this is just something I came up with years ago. I don't, I don't know, who, it's, it's not in a psychology book. You're not going to find it, but it's the way I understand things. Okay, we, you got three different types of anger, three different types right here. Okay, you got that, that dynamite kind, okay? We, we got the pressure cooker kind, and then we got, we got our uh, crock pot kind. All right, so what in the world is all of that? Y'all kind of know where I'm going? <laughs> you got this dynamite can, right? It's just explosive. I mean, something happens and it's like fire in the hole. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And, it, it, and we even got a statement about all that kind of stuff. We say, boy, she really has a, what do we say? <laughs> Y'all picked up on that. I thought, Lord, there, there she is. <laughs> there she is. Here, catch this. <laughs> No, he, he really has a short fuse, right? That we use that terminology because, but, but you know, that something, incident happens, maybe not even a big deal sometimes. Get that for me, will you? Hello. Tell him I'm preaching right now. <laughs> but, but this kind of anger doesn't last long, but when it explodes, it leaves quite a mess and literally scars a lot of people around, don't you? Ah. Uh, and it can get way out of hand, too. Lots of carnage. Lots of stuff. The short-term effect for the person that's got the explosive anger, you know, once they get done with their deal, what, what's usually their reaction? I feel better. I got it off my chest. And now everybody else is bleeding and trying to figure out which, you know, when they're going to move out the house. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. You know, uh, the long-term effect can be very severe damage to relationships and people. It can be that. And it will cause other people to retaliate towards you. And they'll fight that fire with more fire. Oftentimes. Or it'll cause people to withdraw from you. It just won't have anything to do with you. So you got that, that dynamite, explosive kind, all right? So now, what about the pressure cookers kind? Y'all remember the old pressure cookers? How many of y'all still use these things? Y'all still use them? Not really. Anybody ever had one blow up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've had some stuff happen at the house. We, dude, they got better ones. But, but you put whatever you're going to cook in this pressure cooker and you put it on the heat and the heat does what to the pot? Because you got, you got this thing on this top, you got it sealed, don't you? What's the heat begin to do? It, it builds pressure and the pressure and the heat inside of this cooks what, whatever, you know, cabbage or greens or roast or whatever you're cooking or whatever. You can cook anything in it, I guess, can't you? Pretty much. Pretty much, if you want to, yeah. And and then what happens? What what's this little thing? What's this do? That's lets the pressure out. And it's not necessarily explosive. You hope it don't. That that thing's on there, so it it, it doesn't. It it, it just kind of every now and again it just. Well, this is that, that pressure cooker type. You know, they they just it just comes out of them all the time. Just just meanness here and fussing here and a little bitterness here. And, Sarcasm here and digs flying out, and it's a little bit all over the place. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> They'll be in traffic and somebody just won't do nothing. You know, that store, at the office, whatever, maybe at home, you know. But the problem is, is that this just constantly get, starts to eat at your relationships. All this pressure release, making you feel better and everybody else can't wait to get out of the car. You know, we, are we there yet? You know, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah, she, <laughs> I mean these terms in, in like a, a, a neutral way. You understand that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not doing the pronoun thing. Uh, so this right here, this pressure cooker guy, this is, this is anger that's now crystallized into an attitude. It's trouble, it's trouble, all right? So now we, we go to the crockpot folks. 
Okay, so the crock pot, of course, like the pressure cooker, you can about cook anything in here, right? I mean, I, I got to be six foot three, 215 pounds. Um, <laughs> that's funny, isn't it? <laughs> I got to be the a crock pot contributed greatly to that because mama used it. She worked all the time and come home from church. I mean, you come into the house right after church and there would be, she'd have roast and potatoes and carrots almost as a Sunday meal, every, almost every Sunday, you know. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for crock pots. <laughs> so the crock pot type is, you know, it, it, you don't even know something's going on in there, do you? It, it's, it's a slow cook, isn't it? It's a slow cook. So you put this thing on. You put this thing on six, six hours, or I think it may even have a setting up to 10 hours. And you just put whatever you're going to cook in there, and, and you can't really tell nothing's going on because, you know, the person's got this kind of crockpot thing, they're still smiling. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, yeah, I'm fine. It's all right. How are we doing? Oh, we're good. You're more time to think about yeah. So they, they, they're smiling on the outside, but what's happening on the inside? Well, the heat's, the heat's rising. They're heating it up. And, and these folks don't always retaliate initially, and they may not even retaliate for a while. They, they get, they're slow cooking. These are folks that keep score. They know stuff. They remember stuff. In fact, if they get hot enough, they even remember stuff that didn't even happen. You understand? And she, and she, the, they, <laughs> he, you know, it's just stupid, yeah, Ron. <laughs> she keep a score over there, I see it, it's happening, yeah, that's right. And if not properly dealt with, okay, this crockpot person, if not properly dealt with, guess what eventually happens? You, you keep saying it over here. What eventually happens? Something explodes. And it's usually, I mean, this is the person that takes out the trash and don't come back. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what happened today. I wasn't trying to bring that up. This, this is the person that just will absolutely just, eventually, they'll take all they're going to take, and then the next thing you know, something drastic happens. You know. So, so we got these three types. This dynamite, you, we, we know about that, right? The pressure cooker and the crock pot. It's standing on my wig. <laughs> now, which, which one's good? Which one is Jesus talking about? Now, he wouldn't use this terminology, but he's just talking about anger in general. This is just how we kind of process it kind of thing, you know, that, that kind of deal. Now, Jesus didn't want us to have any of that in us. He didn't want you exploding on people. He didn't want you venting on people. He don't want you just slow baking so you can just get them when you want to get them kind of thing. He, he, he doesn't want anger to be in us like that. Okay. So let's, let's just do a little exercise right here. Y'all uh, got my scriptures? All right, so this is the order we're going to read them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. So who, who's got Proverbs 14, 17? All right, Ms. Susan. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked intentions is hatred. All right. A quick, uh, 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 let's read that first part again. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly. Ah, so that's the guy who got the short fuse. We talked about him, wasn't it? And, and, and what happens with his rationale and his wisdom? It just goes out the window, doesn't it? What's the next one? Proverbs 16, 32. This is good wisdom in all this. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth the spirit than he that taketh the city. Ooh, that's, that's a big deal. So it's, it's that self-control thing that the Holy Spirit brings us. That, that's what God's looking for. And that, that's, that's a strong man. That's a strong woman that can control themselves. It's better than somebody that can take a city. It might be harder, too, <laughs> sometimes. What's the next one? Proverbs 19, 11. Who's got that? A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. All right. Read that first part one more time. A person's wisdom yields patience. Okay. I read yeah, read it is second. to one's glory to overlook an offense. Okay, so, so that offense, that's a, the offense is what starts it all, right? In a particular individual. And gets, tr tr triggers that anger, whatever it might be, whatever type it might be. But you know what? It's, it's okay sometimes to look at somebody and say, I'm, I'm going to let that slide. 
That's what he's, that's, that's, that's my Memphis vernacular for that passage right now. I'm, I'm just going to let that slide. I'm not, not even going to bother with all that. All right, who's, got, who's got the next one? 22, 24. Don't be free and angry people or associate with hot tempered people. Okay, wonder why. Don't be a friend to ang angry people and don't associate with hot tempered people. Wonder why. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you pick up some tricks, won't you? You pick up some tricks, but guess what else will happen? You'll get into some situations, won't you? Mm hmm. That, that's, all this just kind of speaks for itself. I, Ecclesiastes 7 9, who's got that? Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Anger lodges in the heart of fools. It just ain't real smart, is it? Colossians 3 8. Okay, so he, he says, put it off. Like, like you would take off an old jacket that what you didn't need to wear anymore. Take it off. Put it, put it out of your life. Take it off of you. Put, what was the list? What did it start with? Anger. Anger. Wrath. Wrath. Malice. Blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Okay, so those, those first three especially. Anger, wrath, and malice. It kind of went with that progression I was talking about earlier to get to that murder thing. Hmm. And the last, James 1, 19 through 20. Who's got that? Bibi? So then, my brethren, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Okay, so we should be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, slow to get mad, slow to, slow to anger, right? Because the wrath of man will not produce what's right. Not in God's eyes. It'll produce what's right in that man's eyes, but that's, or that woman's eyes, but that's not what God's eyes. It will not produce what's right according to God. It don't matter how mad you get. Hmm. Well, that's just a little scripture. We, we could look at 50 more, really. But I think you kind of get the point, all right? Now, now let's uh, go back to our little quote again. There is nothing that can be done with anger that cannot be done better without it. Okay? I want you to think about that. Raising your kids, your marriage, your business, your life in general. Okay? Now, let's close it with the story. The story of Cain and Abel. Remember that story? Remember that? We, we studied it a few, few months ago by, by now because we're, we're in Genesis in the 20s now. Genesis 4, Cain and Abel. What, what's their relationship with each other? Brothers. They're brothers, aren't they? Who's their mom and daddy? Adam. Adam and Eve. And now Genesis 4 is the first case story after Genesis 3 with the fallout or the fall of man and all the consequences. Of that. They're outside the garden. Now this is what life is like outside the garden. Brothers fight. Okay. <laughs> Both of them come to God to worship. And you go read Genesis 4. It's, it's, a, it's one of my favorite stories, really. It just has so much in it. It's just in a few verses. They both come to worship God. They both come to offer a sacrifice. Cain, what's, what's his occupation? He's a farmer, right? Tiller of the ground is what King James says. He, he's a farmer. Abel's what? He, he's a shepherd. So they've they got two different occupations. Both of them are necessary for the family to be able to be sustained. So Cain, being a farmer, he brings some vegetables from his garden. Okay, cucumbers, he brings a few tomatoes, and you know, maybe some bell peppers, he brings it out all, and lays it out there before God. Okay. Abel, he's a, he's a shepherd, so likely it doesn't say sheep. It says he brought something from his flock, but we're going to just kind of go with sheep because that kind of takes, takes the line on through the text. He, he brings... Maybe, maybe a sheep to God. Okay? Now, it's not, it's not the, the offering that's the problem. Because later on, God will have grain offerings, and there'll be all kinds of produce offerings and things like that that'll be in the law of Moses. God accepts those kind of things. Preachers accept those kind of things. I, I, I was raised off of chicken and vegetables. I mean, people bring you eggs. I mean, they, they didn't have money to make tithes, so they would bring eggs and stuff and deer meat and stuff like that. I, I mean... 
you know, we, we've been living like that in the church for a long time. So that's, that is part of our worship. It's, it's viable part of our worship and valid. But, but something happens in, in the transaction between God and, and these men. God doesn't accept Cain's offering. Scripture doesn't tell us why. We speculate that there was just something wrong with Cain. There was something wrong there. Especially because God said, if, if you did right, if you did the right thing, it would be okay. Maybe there's something wrong with his heart. I don't know. Maybe he offered it in, in the wrong kind of heart. But it does bring up a question. Does, it, does, God doesn't just accept everything we bring him. I mean, God's not like the church yard sale. You know, the church yard sale, everybody, we just take everything. Broke pianos and stuff you want to get out of your basement and out of your, out of your garage. And we, you just bring it up here and hope the church can sell it. And we end up having to take it to the dump. Ain't anybody ever had a yard sale like that? <laughs> Build a fire, that's right. God accepts Abel's worship. He rejects Cain. And Cain is triggered bad. Cain gets extremely mad. What do you think he's feeling? Jealous. He's jealous? What else? Angry. He's angry? We'll read that verse in just a minute. It, it's God almost tell, God tells him like he should have known better. Is the way he says it to him. We'll read that in just a second. He's, he feels rejected. He feels inferior. All those things that really tend to drive a person in the ground, right? And what what was Cain's solution to the problem? Okay, well, logically, Cain should should. Be like, oh, oh okay, uh, let me go back and get something else and see if that'll do good. But his solution, instead of fixing himself or his offering or whatever he, he was doing, he lashes out at his brother. And instead of doing better and correcting his mistakes, he gets mad at somebody else. Does that sound familiar? Mm. And here's where it gets interesting. This, this verse right here. God comes to Cain. I'm not sure if he came in person or if it was a voice or whatnot. But it says the Lord came and spoke to Cain. And the Lord said, Cain, why are you angry? Why are you so mad, son? What has gotten in your crawl? That's, that's a good question for us in, in the middle of our situation. Why, why are you so angry and why has your countenance fallen? Why are you so down in the dumps about all this? And here's to address what you're talking about, Miss Linda. If you do well, will you not be accepted? See, kind of, kind of that idea, it, it's, it's not you, Cain. I'm not rejecting you. you. You just didn't do the right thing. I'm not rejecting you. You would be accepted if you did the right thing. Change what you're doing, man. But he took it very personal, as if God was rejecting him. And if you do well, which is what I'm saying, Miss Linda, it implies that he knew what to do right. And listen, I mean, this is the anger story. This is a story about anger and jealousy and all the things that go with it sometimes. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. I don't know if you remember when we went through that study right there. That sin lies at the door. That, that is a picture the English translation doesn't really do it as much justice as, as what the Hebrews does. The Hebrew paints a picture that if you don't do the right thing and you keep going down this path, I want you to know that sin is like a crouching beast, like a crouching wild beast that is waiting for you to make the wrong move. And when you keep going down this path, it will launch on you and it will destroy your life. That's the picture. Because, see, you're, you're angry, whatever it is you got going on, however you, you're venting it out. But one thing anger does, it blinds you to consequences, doesn't it? It just does. Or it makes you not care. You throw caution to the wind. 
And he tells Cain, he said, man, right there behind all of that hostility that's inside of you and all that jealousy and all that envy, all that stuff that's, that's rising up, all that anger that's rising up on the inside of you, he said, I, I'm going to give you a revelation, son. You would have no clue where you're headed with this. But I'm going to tell you, there's something that you can't see that is about to eat your lunch. And it wants to kill you. It wants to destroy you. But here's the good news, Cain. You're not a victim. You don't have to be a victim. You should rule over that. All that's churning on the inside of you, take charge of that and don't let that rule your life. You rule it. And I believe that's what Jesus is telling us over in Matthew. He said, don't, don't even go there. Paul's telling us to put those things off because we're, we're not victims. We're very responsible for our decisions. Even when you get into blind rage, and all, you are very responsible. I had a situation not too long ago where the kid said, well, I'm sorry, I just went blind. Well, no, sorry, don't cut that, son. You're still responsible. You made a choice. You went there. You know what I'm talking about? And you, you and I can rule over these things. Jesus gives us strength to do it. He gives us instruction to do it. You should rule over it. And my point, my goal for us tonight is, is listen. Listen to this. I ran all these stop signs. I, I made tons of mistakes in these areas. Let, let's don't keep going down that path. You know what I'm talking about? You've got to learn. Ask Jesus to help you to rule over that anger and over that tongue and over all that stuff that just keeps vomiting out on everybody. It's not good. So how do you do that? Well, number one, you need to realize, that's why we did these little illustrations. We, we all recognize this. When I was doing all that, people and names and events coming to mind, I guarantee you. We've all experienced it. We've all lived it. And we realize we got a problem. And, and some of us got bigger problems than others in this area. Ask Jesus to help you with it. Ask him to help you rule over it. Because you, 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 you don't have to fight this battle by yourself. Wouldn't it have been a great thing if Cain would have asked God, what, what, do you, what should I do now? We, we have no recollection of his response to any of these questions. We do know what he did. He probably already figured out what he was going to do. And God intercepts him. God intercedes. And he says, no, stop. Stop, 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 sign, stop this. And the boy just whew, hit the accelerator, didn't he? Just blew right through that stop sign. Hmm. What if Cain would have said, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to check myself right here. What, what do I need to do? Will, will you help me with this? You'd have a different story. You know what I'm talking about? I, I would say when we read that story, that's what we need to do. We need to say, whoa, okay, God, Jesus, will you help me with this? Help me rule over this. Because, see, we, we need help because we, we've lost a lot of battles to it already, I'm sure. We need help. So come, let's ask him to help us. Can we do that? Our Lord, help us. Uh, you set the bar high and you just expect a lot. Not just because your standards are so high, but Lord, you, you desire so much good for us. And you know, walking down those other paths, Lord, is just not going to be right for us. It's not going to be right for your name. It's not going to be right for the people that we love and in our lives. So I pray you'd help us to take your advice that you gave to Cain. To rule over it, Lord. And we just ask you to show us how. We know we're, we're just a half a decision away from doing the wrong thing. We need your help, Lord. Help us. And as you have done with me in different times and seasons in my life, Lord, I pray that whoever may be struggling, maybe they're watching on Facebook, something of that nature, Lord, that you would just bring your delivering power and you would break that bondage to anger, that bondage to try to control and manipulate. You'd break that in Jesus' name. 
and you'd set your people free. Teach us, Lord. Teach us how to control our emotions. And teach us that just because we think it don't mean we've got to say it. Help us, Lord. Help us to be your people and everything that that means. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.